sábado, bom sábado. Uh, let's see, bom sabat, shabbat shalom. And I have run out of languages. It's good to see you guys. Um, I hope you guys are having a really good day. I'm having a wonderful Sabbath so far. It's been going very well. I get to see some awesome people this morning. Um, so let's start with a word of prayer. We're going to be continuing talking about Joseph and his dysfunctional family that the Lord loved and died for. All right. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord. The sun is shining. It's shining in the East Bay. It's shining in San Francisco. It's shining on the peninsula, Lord. We just have good weather all around across the Bay Area. So, Lord, we want to thank you for that. Also, Lord, we want to thank you for the fact that the people that are here in church right now, there's quite a few of us, um, that we woke up this morning and were able to come to church. Lord, we just want to give you all the praise and glory. Um, and right now, as we dive into the Sabbath school lesson, we want to ask that the presence of the Holy Spirit is here in the church with us, Lord. So we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, um, we just ask that you forgive us for our sins, cover us with your blood and your atonement, Lord. And also, Lord, um, we want to thank you for bringing us through another week as well. And I'm sure everybody has a story about something that happened this past week for your glory, and things where they had to deal with trials and tribulations. So Lord, I want to thank you for giving us the strength to get through another week. And Lord, I just pray that everybody that's here and everybody that is on their way here in transit, that I see all of them in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, so um, we are going to go ahead and get started with uh, this week, which is lesson 12, June 11th through 17th, or actually this past week's. Joseph, Prince of Egypt. You know, the title kind of made me chuckle because I remember when, um, I don't know if it was Disney or Pixar, they came out with a movie called The Prince of Egypt, but it was about Moses. It wasn't about Joseph. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, the irony of it didn't escape me. So I'm going to go deep before I dive into um, Sabbath afternoon and Sunday. So that's June 11th, June 12th. Let me do my go deep. So there's some parallels with Joseph, Mordecai, and Daniel. So you guys may remember Mordecai. He was the uncle of Queen Esther um, when, the, um, when the Jews were taken into captivity. Um, and also Daniel, everybody knows the prophet Daniel, when the Jews were taken into captivity um, by the Babylonians. So with the Mordecai, they were taken, they were living in uh, the Persian Empire, and with Daniel, they were living in the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire is what we now know as modern-day Iraq, um, which the U.S. invaded. And <laughs> couldn't help but slide that in there. And then uh, the Persian Empire is what we know as Iran. Okay. So let's look at the parallels. Joseph interpreted dreams. So did the prophet Daniel. Now Mordecai did not interpret any dreams. Let's look at the next one. Um, they were both put in a situation where they would might have to compromise their morals and principles. So with Joseph, he was with a woman um, in a house as a servant. I would really say it's really an indentured servitude, but we'll call it a slave. Um, and she was the wife of Potiphar, and she tried to tempt him to sleep with her, and he refused to do it, and then she lied and um, had him put in prison. With Mordecai, Esther's uncle, um, Haman, who we know is the villain in that story, wanted Mordecai to bow down to him. And as we know, we don't bow down to human beings. The only person we worship is God. And Mordecai refused to do it. He held to his principles. With the prophet Daniel, um, two times we see in, actually three times in, in the book of Daniel, we see him not... Um, not succumbing to the secular pressure around him. The first time was with his diet, so he was showing that he had impeccable control of his appetite. Um, he didn't eat the king's food, he didn't drink the, queen, the, king's, the king's wine. Um, the second time we see was Nebuchadnezzar uh, had a dream about a statue, and um, Daniel uh, and the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not bow to the statue, Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to bow to the statue. And the final time was there was a law passed by politicians in, um, in, uh, in Susa at the time. And they wanted to have everybody, as soon as somebody played an instrument, bow down to uh, the king at the time. Uh, I believe it was King Cyrus. 
And so Daniel refused to do that. He decided to pray. They had a law that you couldn't pray. The only person you could pray for, pray to, excuse me, was the king. So we have that with Daniel. Okay, and then um, we have the time that Joseph was tempted and we have the time that Mordecai was tempted. And Daniel, we know three incident, instances which I just named off in which he was tempted. Now, we also have Joseph was made a ruler over Egypt. He was like a governor. He was right underneath the Pharaoh. Um, Mordecai wasn't made a ruler, but he was honored by King Xerxes. The king remembered that Mordecai had prevented an assassination and so he had uh, Mordecai put on his own horse, on the king's horse, and he had the king's robe put on him, okay? And with Daniel, Daniel was, um, he found favor with more than one ruler. So he actually saw several rulers. He lived long enough to see more than one king. Um, and they made him and put him in a, appointed him to a political position as well. So we see this happening with these three people. Um, the other thing is Joseph saved his people from a famine. So, you know, we know that his immediate family would eventually become the children of Israel, their descendants. Um, Mordecai, um, he was involved in the sense that he urged Esther to fast and pray and go to the king and save the people from a royal decree to be put to death. So we know in the book of Esther, uh, the people were told they would have to be put to death. And with Daniel, um, he repents on behalf of his people and requests his people to be restored. Okay, so those are the parallels between Joseph, Mordecai, and the prophet Daniel. Okay, let's go ahead and let's go to um, Sabbath and Sunday last week. So Genesis 41, you guys, this is a lot to read. I hope all of you online and all of you that are here in the congregation have had a chance to study this on your own this week because we're not going to have the opportunity to read each chapter in entirety here at church right now. So chapter 41, um, let me give you an overview and then um, I'll give you my takeaway and ask you guys some questions. Um, so chapter 41, we start with Pharaoh has the dream about the lean, the seven lean fat cows, right? Um, that come up out of the Nile and then seven skinny sickly cows come up and they eat the fat cows. And then Pharaoh has another dream about um, seven stalks of grain that come up and they're really delicious looking and healthy looking and then seven more stalks come up and eat the other stalks. He wants to know what the dream means so he gets his um, magicians and his wise men and um, they can't interpret it. But then uh, the cupbearer, the butler, he remembers, oh yeah, that guy that I saw in prison, Joseph. So he brings Joseph, Joseph comes and he interprets the dream on the spot. And that actually kind of separates him from Daniel because Daniel had to go and pray before he interpreted the dream. Joseph is given from the Holy Spirit the ability to interpret it on the spot. Um, and so he tells Pharaoh, you know, you're going to have seven years of plenty and then you're going to have seven years of famine. And then he tells him what he should do to keep the people from Egypt, people in Egypt from starving to death and his own household from starving to death. And Pharaoh is so impressed with this that he says, oh my goodness, who can we find that is going to, um, that, can, that can make these types of wise decisions? Um, is there anyone here that can take care of this situation? And so he appoints Joseph to the position that he was in. So that's where we, we are at with Genesis 41. Okay, so what I wanna ask you guys, and that's for Sabbath and also for Sunday. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, what is God's place in the success of Joseph? What is his place in the success of Joseph? You mean, when you say place, what do you mean? Well, what is God's role? That's a better way of putting it. What is God's role in the success of Joseph? He's intricately involved in everything that happens to him. Yeah. Yeah, intricately. Yeah. yeah, he's intricately involved in everything that happens to him. Okay, I like that answer. From the time he was taken. Yeah, from the time he was taken, exactly. Okay, so here's some things I want to say is that no one can give the wisdom that God can give to a person. So, you know, we love these human beings, we love quotes, we love quotes. We love quotes from people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Mother Teresa, 
uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. We love like really famous quotes, you know, um, the um, Roman Emperor uh, Marcus Aurelius. We love these quotes. We like putting them in emails and having them as like bylines at the bottom of the email. We like to put them in greeting cards. We even put them up on walls, right? And we frame them, quotes, okay? Or we get quotes on t-shirts and then people stop and read it when we're walking by. But the thing is, those people are wise, but God, God actually is wiser than they are, okay? And it's important to remember that. And any wisdom that human beings have comes from the Lord. So you think about Martin Luther King or you think about Mother Teresa, their wisdom came from God. Uh, the second thing is that this is really interesting. Joseph didn't try to verbally coerce or persuade Pharaoh that he should worship the one true God. So if you read Genesis, where Joseph finally meets Pharaoh, and he make, they make the introduction, he interprets the dreams, Pharaoh appoints him to a political position, all the way to the end when Joseph dies, right? Never once do you see any verse where he's like, and you need to turn to the Lord, right? That doesn't happen. So it shows that he witnessed with his actions. His behavior demonstrated who the one true God was. Um, the next thing is that, and this is interesting, when Joseph was a boy, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He had a motor mouth. He's running his mouth like a motorbike, right? Um, telling his brothers about his dreams. And you know what's really interesting is that God gave Joseph the dreams, but he never said, Joseph, share this with your brothers and your dad. Do we want to see in scripture where Joseph says, tell your family about your dreams? So what that lesson to us is sometimes God gives it to us, it's only for us. It doesn't necessarily mean we're supposed to share it with people, okay? Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, have, isn't it kind of, would you think it was somewhat natural that if we have a dream that's out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. that we're going to talk to somebody about it? I absolutely agree and think you're correct, but the thing is that doesn't mean we should do it. So just because we can and we're excited about a dream or anything that happens that seems like it could be um, something unusual, I would even say supernatural, doesn't necessarily mean we have to share it with people. Sometimes things are blessings and they're just for us alone. Because you don't know where people are at with their walk with the Lord and people hear things through their filters. And humanity, and it's not Adventists, it's not Muslims, it's not black people or white people. Humans tend to be judgmental. Not all, but many people do. And so you're, let's say you have this amazing dream and you really feel compelled that the Holy Spirit gave it to you. I would say ask the Lord if you're supposed to share it with people. And see, Joseph didn't do that. He was a kid. He was like, I had these two dreams, you know, and he shared it with his brothers. And we know about the dynamics with the family, with the brothers being jealous of him and Jacob not being dad of the year, only favoriting the sons of Rachel, right? So the takeaway from that is sometimes God uh, gives us things that are only for us. It doesn't necessarily mean we're supposed to share it with people. We can ask the Lord, do you want me to share this with someone as a testimony? And if you do, who, who do you want me to share it with? There's been times I've shared my testimony with people and it fell on deaf ears. They thought I was bragging. And I wasn't. I was just really excited for something the Lord did for me. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in grad school, I got some money that I wasn't expecting, and it was a lot, and it was going to help me pay for books and stuff. And I was in the bathroom, and I was just so grateful to God. Um, and I saw this girl. She wasn't a Christian, didn't, had nothing to do with Christianity, uh, just, just a classmate. And I was so excited. I shared it with her. She was offended. Went back and told a roommate, Kylie's bragging about the fact that she got money for school. You see, my intention was pure, but I didn't really think about it. I was just talking. I was just really excited. I was like, I'm going to be able to pay for my books, you know, that type of thing. And it was the Lord, you know, the Lord had moved so I could get some money for school, right? So this is what I'm talking about. Sometimes we don't need to share things, okay? So uh, you, in your Go Deep, you did some comparisons, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's an interesting go deep uh, what you just said there, answer, because now what brought to my mind is the comparison. You've got this young guy who's maybe 17, 15, 16, 16 years 17, old. yeah. Then you've got, as we gather uh, in the New Testament, we've got Mary. Yep. Who's like 16, 15, 16, 17 years old, and she gets this uh, angel. She tells her she's carrying. Yeah, she kind of keeps it all to herself. Yes, Mary doesn't run around telling everybody in Bethlehem. 
So this is kind of like maybe the maturity, the difference between guys and gals. Guys and girls tend to be a well. little more mature. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to make it about gender, but <laughs> I was, it, it's just different people, yeah, you know, yeah. people mature at a different pace, uh, psychologically and spiritually, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was going to say, in Mary's case, she didn't really want to tell everybody she was Yeah. Because, it's like, like, you're a married girl, what you doing? Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, exactly. Like, the stigma of society, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, you think so? You think he's right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I I, I think because it had to do with pregnancy. In this case, yeah, yeah, because of you know pregnancy is a very serious thing and bringing a life into the world. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to say, my fourth point. So the first one I made was that no one can give us the wisdom that God gave us, and I named off famous people like MLK, Mother Teresa, Malcolm X, and I said that even their wisdom that we like to quote. It comes from the Lord. The second thing was that Joseph didn't try to verbally coerce or persuade Pharaoh that God was the one true God. He did it with his behavior. So his actions spoke louder than words. That's something for all of us to remember. And then the third thing was that when Joseph was younger, he was immature. He couldn't keep his mouth shut about the dreams God gave him. And that didn't necessarily mean he was supposed to share them with people, even though the Lord gave him those dreams. The fourth point I was going to make is that God gives us the gift of discernment and heavenly wisdom. And he puts us in a position that points others to the cross. So we have to ask God for the gift of discernment. Not everyone is discerning. Some people think everybody's their best friend, you know. Right, I'm gonna tell you about what happened to me last week and this week and what happened to you in my childhood and what happened to you, me here and there, and maybe they can't handle whatever you're gonna tell them, you know. Um, and maybe they don't need to know. It's private information. So. God gives us the gift of discernment and heavenly wisdom, and God is the one who puts us in a position and points others, uses us to point others to Jesus Christ and the cross. Okay, yes, Monday. So we've got Joseph rise to power. I just gave you an overview of 41, and now we're going to Monday. Joseph confronts his brothers. So Genesis chapter 42, okay. Um, let's go ahead and go there. So. This is when the famine hit. And it says here that the famine hit the entire world, at least the known world. So if you look at Genesis chapter 41, verse 57, Genesis chapter 41, verse 57. Genesis chapter 41, verse 57, it says, can somebody read that verse? It says, so all countries came to Joseph in by grain because the famine was severe in all lands. In all lands. So they came from all countries in all lands. So this wasn't an isolated thing that was only domestic and in Egypt. It was everywhere. Okay. So let me guys ask you guys a question. Before I go into chapter 42 where the brothers come and they have to prostrate themselves before Joseph and ask for food and all that and they don't recognize him. We know the story. Before I go into that, what is a famine a symbolic of? What is a famine symbolic of? A famine. Biblically? I can't hear you. Biblically? Biblically, yeah. Okay, okay. So, symbolic of biblically, isn't it? Symbolic of a, a dearth of uh, the, spirit of, the spirit of God in the land, the knowledge of God in, uh -huh. in the land. Is that, is that what I... Uh -huh. Uh, that's not, that's not, but you're not, you're not emphatic about that. No, 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 I agree. I'm sorry. Let me smile more. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the famine is symbolic of um, not having God. Okay. So, so spiritual starvation, right? Okay. All right. Uh, maybe we could even say spiritual corruption. Okay. Spiritual deprivation, not having the Lord. All right. So let me ask you a question. Why does God allow a famine to occur in Egypt and the world, the known world? At, at least according to verse 57 of chapter 41. We know it. It says all countries, all lands. So that's the known world. Why does God allow this famine to happen? Why do you guys think he allows it? Because he could have, he didn't have to. And he told Pharaoh it was going to happen in advance through Joseph interpreting the dream. So why does God allow it, Pastor? It's interesting that in the short lives of all the patriarchs, 
they all experience it from the family. Mm, that's a good point. So I don't know if people online heard Pastor said in uh, the lives of all three patriarchs, they all experienced a famine. Okay. Did you want to say something, Nicole? I mean, God allows famines in our lives. Do you think, is it sometimes when it's not caused by us? It's not something that we've done. There are times when it's not something we've done, but we have a famine. Do you think it's because the Lord's using it to bring you closer to him? I'm not talking about deliberately sinning. That's a whole separate thing. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor. All right. Well, I prayed. I prayed. I prayed a lot before I started writing all my notes out. So, so maybe the Lord He He spoke to you and spoke to me, and boom. Both in mind mill. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, do you guys think that the Lord allows a famine to occur in our lives? Not famines that we've caused. I'm not talking about you go out going out and sinning and me going out and sinning. But do you think He allows it to happen? Okay, I see two people nodding yes. No, 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 that's not me. I'm trying to figure out. Um, for me, often I think in terms of once sin came into the world, uh -huh. uh, nature and much of what we kind of took its own, took its course outside of the intent that God had for it, right? Uh -huh. And I think what for me often I kind of try to draw uh, uh, meanings or spiritual meaning for me out of the difficulties like the earthquakes that hit, the, the, the wars that happen. I, I tend to, to attribute these different problems to God just as it was not God's fault that Joseph is in Egypt. Uh -huh. But he allowed it to happen. And, but that's the deal. Uh, that's the deal. So for what, how does God, for me, it's the, the Joseph story. I don't know if you, you it, I'm going there too soon. There's some, it's okay. The, the Joseph story for me is and how God can use your screw-ups to turn something good into it. God can take a bad situation and make, make it good. Good, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so that, well, that's because the brothers did that. They sold Joseph into slavery, right? Uh -huh. Okay, that's their screw-up. But looking at it from the perspective of Joseph, he didn't do anything to be sold into slavery. I mean, maybe he was the bratty kid brother, but that doesn't mean he deserved to be a slave, right? Okay, so God allowed Joseph to be sold. He could have stopped it. How come God didn't allow Jacob to know that his son wasn't dead and he was over in Egypt? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, because Joseph, I mean, his dad didn't trust him. Right. Right. So that's a pain, though. He doesn't even know the boy's anything. He thinks the boy's dead. Yeah, because they took a goat, yeah. put yeah. blood on the coat. Yeah. And brought it to his father. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So your question is. What I said, why does God allow a famine to occur? And then why does he allow? Why does he? Your next question was also about Joseph. I mean, uh, Jacob. Why does God? I would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, because how come, okay, I want you to think about something bad that happened to you in your life. I'm sure you've got many examples to draw upon that you didn't cause it. Okay? Like, I didn't think of, I had an accident. I didn't cause that, right? Okay. But why, why did God allow it? So, I want you to think of something in your life, your personal lives. Don't shout it out. Keep it in your head. That happened that you know you weren't at fault. You were not the, per this was not your sin. You weren't the perpetrator. Why did God allow that to happen? How come he doesn't wrap you in bubble wrap? Do you see what I'm saying? How come he doesn't wrap you in bubble wrap so nothing nothing happens to you? Right. 
Right. There's, there's no reason for it. Yeah. Because like I said, yes. we, we don't form a relationship with him to trust him. Right. Right. What were you going to say? I was going to say, I, I feel that God allowed it to happen because he, he um, had a purpose for Joseph. And that's that's why I feel about it. Yeah. So yeah. Because God knows, you know, every, you know, everything. Well, even as far as his, what his brothers did to him, and then the, you know, causing their father to, to just grieve over um, uh, the fact that he thought Joseph had died. They told him that he was no more. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, they lied to their father. They lied to their father. Yeah. But everything that happened to, everything that happened in Joseph's life was getting him to the point where God used him in the situation with the family. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yes. Well, Nicole makes an effort to come in, but hang in my air, and I'm going to speak to that. Hang in the air for me. Well, let me speak to Nicole's comment real quick about, and I thought it was kind of interesting. She says, God doesn't sit on the corner of her bed in the morning and say, okay, Nicole, these are the things you need to do. Right. You know, and need to do, meaning if you do these things, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what you're saying is, even when you do these things, you're not okay. That's not what I'm saying. Oh. That's not what I'm like, saying at all. Okay. I'm saying that bad things happen to good people. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that that. Okay. I want to make sure, make that clear. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because what's hanging in there for me is two things. One, Nicole's comment, what's hanging in there. Maybe God does sit in our bed every day when we lift up this Bible and we start reading it. <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I mean a physical manifestation. Physical manifestation. Just sitting there and sitting so, like, why doesn't your guardian angel sit on the edge of your bed yeah, yeah. with the presence of the Holy Spirit and a dove above your bed in the no, morning? Jesus himself. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. I want Jesus himself to sit here and say, you're going to be all right, girl. Just do this thing. Yeah. Just trust me. Yeah. I'm like, okay, but no, I need to play. I need to see what you're playing here so I can trust you. Yeah. But it's unrealistic of us to think that we would do that. The only thing you said to me was trust you. Yes. Have a relationship yeah. with you. Yeah. I will fix it, yeah. just not in your time. Jacob telling his, his sons, okay, why are you guys looking at each other? Go down to Egypt. They've got food. We don't. Get some food. Then when we get to verse 6, it says Joseph was the governor over the land. Okay? And then verse 7, it says Joseph saw his brothers. All right? They didn't recognize him. So I'm going to explain real quick why. Joseph had been in Egypt. He'd been away from his family for 22 years. So they sold him into slavery at 17. At age 30, he was before Pharaoh, right? Okay, and then you've got seven, year, seven good years, so that's age 30 to 37, right? And then sometime in the seven bad years, we don't know if it was year one or year five, then that's when he sees his brothers. So they're not going to, I mean, think about how you, different you look now from when you were 17. 
right? Or how different you look now from, seven, you looked from age 17 to age 37. You still look like you, but you looked a little bit different, right? They haven't seen him since he was a kid. And then on top of that, these were a Semitic group of people, okay? They're from Canaan, which we now know as Israel, right? So they had beards, you know, they, they dressed differently, they had full facial hair. The Egyptians, I was, I got into Egyptology this week, I was reading archaeology. They shaved all, all their body hair. Yes, yes. The men and the women were hairless, right? And one of the reasons for that was they had a really serious problem with mites and lice. It was very serious. Plus, they're by the Nile River, and the Nile is the largest river in the world. First the Nile, then it's the Amazon, right? Um, so you've got this huge river and this river valley, right, with lots of mosquitoes, lice, and mice. And don't forget, Egypt is in Africa, contrary to what some people like to think. Egypt is in Africa, and they have a problem with malaria, right? So you're going to do everything in your power back then with the technology that you have and what you know, and so they're hairless. So they're these hairless people, the men are, and if you don't believe me, Google Egyptian hieroglyphics and you can see the pictures. These were not hairy people, okay? So they had shaven off their hair, and then they had all of these ointments and, and oils that they wore for hygiene and also to keep the insects away, okay? And from what I was reading online, they shaved their heads as well, and they wore these wigs, right? Okay. And then they put black eyeliner around the eyes. It wasn't to be attractive and sexy. They wore the black eyeliner to keep these tiny bugs out of their eyes. So they have this thick black eyeliner. I don't remember what it was made from, but it was something natural that they made. And the men and women wore it around the eyes. So you've got these hairless people wearing wigs, with eyeliner on the eyes. Do you think they're going to recognize Joseph? And he's over the age of 37. Yeah, yeah. So they're not going to recognize him. Beautiful, beautiful. Girl. Okay. Beautiful. So let's look at here. Good knowledge. Good knowledge. <laughs> Thanks. Google. <laughs> All right. Um, so Good knowledge. We, we have a lot of really interesting things happening here. Um, they confront his brothers, right? He, he confronts his brothers, okay? And we have a lot of, uh, a very, very interesting situation where they're asking him for food and he gives them food and then he does some really interesting things. So I'm not talking about the part with Benjamin. That comes later. I'm just talking about when they initially go, he loads them up with food and then somebody tell me in verse, uh, in chapter 42, what happens? This is not the part where they bring back Benjamin. What happens before that happens? Anybody remember? Got the money in the bags. They got the money in the bags. They away for a while. They traveled for a few, I don't know how long it says that they traveled. But once someplace along the way, one of the boys doesn't get the bag, opens up his bag. Uh -huh. And in the bottom of his bag is his money. Yep. So why did Joseph do that? Why would Joseph do that to his brothers? Was it because he's holding a grudge for 22 years? Testing, grudge testing. match? I'm going to get you guys. I'm going to put money in your bags and have you guys executed. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Elderon said it. Testing, testing, one, two, three. What, do you guys agree with him? He was just trying to test them? Or do you think it was to get revenge? He wanted to test them. He wanted to test them? Okay. All right. Uh, it's, your question is interesting about revenge. Uh, why would the, why would, just my thinking, why does that idea come to you, the revenge idea? Oh, I always think of that whenever people happen, think bad things happen to people in the Bible because a family member did it, like with Esau and Jacob. I always ask, was it because of revenge? That's just me. I always want to know. This family, the family dynamics we're seeing all throughout the Old Testament, there are some unfortunately very dysfunctional families. You know, you got families with half siblings and you know, step siblings and all these siblings and they don't get along and you got the story of Absalom with King David and Amnon and Tamar and all of these yeah, stories. So I always ask. What a great one because now we're talking about retribution versus revenge, aren't we? Right. And now you, when you talk about uh, what Joseph. You, no, you brought a great one up. Joseph in his situation is almost like a retribution type of thing, a payback in a way where Tamar and Absalom is sort of like a revenge. Just, right. Yeah, I'm just thinking you're, you're Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm just, because you asked me why did I bring it up, and yeah. I'm saying whenever I hear about these families in the Old Testament, that's what I, I always want to know. 
Okay, so Genesis uh, 42, let's go ahead and go there. I'm not going to read all of it, I'm just going to read parts of it. So um, they come to them and he he's immediately, he recognizes them. They don't recognize him for the reasons I described. He looks totally different. Um, so he accuses them of being spies. He's like, oh no, you're spies. And that is at uh, verse verse 9. And then verse 10, I'm reading from the Amplified Version on my phone. But they said to him, No, my Lord, for your servants have only come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, I'm at verse 12, No, you have come to see the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers and all the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Please listen, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. That's a lot of information. Did they need to give him that much information? Yes. Okay, you say yes, why do you say yes, Nicole? Because they were about to be executed for stealing some money and be well not stealing money, but for being spies and right. you know, come in and for all they knew, they could have had an army with them that would come and take all of the grain and it would be wouldn't be able to feed everybody who needed it. So we wanted to see if they could now be honest uh-huh. as opposed to the dishonesty that they Honestly, that they displayed when they told their dad he was dead. Uh-huh. Okay, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, really. I, I like the question, though. Did he have to tell? And I would disagree. Like, did you have to tell all that? I would say no. Well, I don't think that they needed to tell all that, no, but I, I agree with the see. sense that he had to do, he had to find out if, if they had changed yeah. and if they, yes. what, what type of people they were. Yeah, but his, they, when they start giving that volunteering that information, that's really their kind of people. Downfall. Right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, but, but he had to say downfall, too, because I can't. You know, when you get in a, a, a lawsuit, for example, your attorney tells you to, if you got a good attorney, he's going to tell you to be quiet and answer only the questions that are asked. And if you can answer them in yes or no, answer them in yes or no. That's true. You know? No, you're right. And, and so your, your question is... They I dig think, a hole for themselves. I think the question, yeah, it's a good question because I think they did talk too much. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was answering part of what she said about Joseph, why he was doing what he did. But yeah, I do, I do think that they talked a lot. But then they were also a fear, in fear for their lives that they might be executed. And when people are afraid, especially when it has to do with law enforcement, they do sometimes talk too much. What do they say? Loose lips sink, sink ships? Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. So he gives them grain, right? Um, and then, I'm still in chapter 42. Okay. Then he says, um, let's see. Hold on. Verse 18. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and you may live before I fear God. So he brings up God. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your place here in prison. But as for the rest of you go, carry grain for famine in your households, but bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you will not die. Of course, their heart's dropping because the the brother is Benjamin, right? Um, And they know their father's been grieving for 22 years over Joseph. Okay. So then I'm skipping down to 21, and they said one to another, truly we are guilty regarding our brother Joseph. He's listening. He speaks Hebrew. They don't know that he can speak Hebrew, okay? They don't know that he's bilingual or trilingual or whatever it is, Um, and they don't even know that he's one of them. He's from the same ethnicity, right? So truly we are guilty regarding our brother Joseph because we saw the distress and anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us to let him go. Yet we would not listen to his cry, so this distress and anguish has come on us. And then Reuben, who never wanted to kill Joseph, we know that now. Reuben answered them in 22, and he says, Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now the accounting for his blood is required of us, for we are guilty of his death. They did not know that Joseph understood their conversation, because he spoke to them through an interpreter. He turned away from his brothers and left them and wept. Then he returned and talked with them and took Simeon from them and bound him in front of them to be kept as a hostage in Egypt. So then he fills their bags up. I'm skipping, skipping because of time. I'm looking at the clock. Um, Loads their donkeys, and then he puts money in their sacks, right? Okay. Um, So when they emptied, I'm on verse 35. Now when they emptied their sacks, every man's bundle of money paid to buy grain was in his sack. When they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me by causing the loss of my children. Joseph is no more, Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin away from me. All these things are working against me. So the father's like, You know, you guys aren't the brightest bunch. You left Simeon down here. Now you're asking to take Benjamin. Okay. 
And he says, my son shall not go down to Egypt. This is verse 38. For his brother is dead and he alone is left of Rachel's children. Okay, so we already know what's going to happen. I'm going to go ahead to 43. Something you were reading there, he mentioned about Simeon, you know. Uh -huh. It shows he, he you know, those first indication that he cared, cared about anybody but those two. Yeah, no, he yeah. did care about those children, right? Yeah. Because those are the ones that are now, Joseph is gone, now Simeon is gone, uh -huh. you know. And, uh, yeah, it gives a little bit of light on, on, uh, on him. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Jacob, yeah. It's a very good point. So, what's really interesting is that the brothers, so I asked what a famine is symbolic of. The brothers were in a famine during their lives, up until the point where they got to Egypt. That's when they left the famine. And I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about they were in a spiritual famine. Because if they had not been in a spiritual famine, if they had had a really close relationship with the Lord, they would not have sold their brother into slavery. They had, first of all, they wouldn't have wanted to commit murder and commit kill a half sibling, um, and then they wouldn't have sold him into slavery. So they were in famine before they went to Egypt, and then when they went to Egypt, um, they realized, you know, that they were where they were at. Because when you get to 42, that's when they're discussing in Hebrew amongst each other in front of Joseph, not knowing he can speak the language. This is this is what we get. We're getting our just desserts for what we did years ago. So that's conviction, okay? That's conviction. We see the start of that conviction, the start of leaving a spiritual famine, all right? Um, somebody go to Romans chapter 319, Romans 319. And when you get to it, just read it out loud in your loudest voice. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that worth what thing soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, thank you so much. So, this directly applies to the brothers, because um, if you look at, it says here, now we saw, know that the, what the thing we know that what things soever the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Thank you for reading that. Um, so they become guilty. Um, now the person that can free us from guilt is Christ, right? But well, they've been keeping a secret for 22 years. That's a pretty huge secret. That's not a thing like I scratched my dad's car when I was 14, and I'm telling you about it now at age 50, right? This is a pretty big secret, trying to kill someone and then selling them into slavery. So they're feeling conviction about their guilt. Somebody else go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And when you get to it, just read it out loud. 1 John, so 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us that's right so the brothers they haven't done it yet in verse chapter 42 but they're going to do it and I like it if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all his fallen righteousness uh, somebody else read Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 When you get to it, just read it out loud. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes, and forsakes him will have mercy. All right. So when we conceal our sins, we don't prosper. But if we confess and renounce them, we get mercy. And we see this happening. We see this happening. We actually get to see forgiveness. We get to see repentance. We get to see reconciliation. Very similar to Jacob and Esau, right? Okay, and what's really interesting is that even though Joseph didn't necessarily trust his brothers, we can tell by what he named his firstborn son, Manasseh, that he had let some things go. So he wasn't necessarily, there was no grudge match. So Manasseh means God has made me forget, okay? So he wasn't sitting there, at, he, now he didn't forget the act, meaning, you know, he didn't immediately go, okay, 
everything's great, everything's fine. But what that means is there was a type of forgiveness, okay? So um, to forget the wrong that was done to him uh, because he needed his freedom. Okay, let's continue. We're going to Tuesday, Joseph and Benjamin. So Genesis 43, and like I said, these are long chapters. We do not have Sabbath school that goes on for six hours, so we don't have time to read these chapters in church. I wish we did, but we don't. So uh, for people that are online, huh? It's a question about your last statement, which is interesting. When you were reading from these texts, and you say we see forgiveness, we see, we see repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Yes. Do you think, um, what's your thinking in regards to repentance and reconciliation? Do you think one who uh, has forgiven someone of uh, what they've done against them should work towards reconciling with them? You're jumping ahead of me. Oh, I have a sorry. whole page about this. Okay, let's go. I love the question. So I'm just going to dive in. Um, so forgive me, guys, if I don't... Um, if I don't ask tons of questions, I'm, I'm not being a good teacher and asking you guys 20 million questions. I have something here to read to you guys. So um, just to go over the, the logistics here, at age 17, he was sold into slavery. He was, uh, you know the story about Potiphar and his philandering wife, okay? We also know that Potiphar probably didn't think his wife was telling the truth because he could have had Joseph killed. Joseph was a nobody. He's a servant slash an indentured servant and he's being accused of sexual assault, maybe even rape, right? And he could have killed him and he didn't. So he puts Joseph in the captain's guard's house. So it's like a special prison, like Bernie Madoff prison, right? Okay, he doesn't get to go to the real prison where you're afraid for your life. So he spends time in prison. He's brought out of prison, brought before Pharaoh at age 30, seven years of plenty, so 37, and then sometime during the seven years of famine. So Joseph is in his late 30s, all right? So he's had, he's had a lot of time to think about this. A lot of time to think about what happened. Okay, so um, here's, what's, here's a couple of things that I took away. So we know when we read chapters 43, 44, and 45, hopefully everybody has read those, that Joseph does indeed forgive his brothers. He does. He does. So here's the thing, and this has to do with what Brother Ron was saying. We should forgive people, but does, that, that does not mean we just should allow them to continue hurting us, okay? So he comes from a dysfunctional family, not his fault, not his brother's fault, it's Jacob's fault, okay? Jacob and Laban, because Laban is the one who gave the two wives, right? So this is way before they were even a thought, before they were even in existence. The family dynamics were already gonna be dysfunctional with the two wives of polygamy, okay? So if anybody ever wants to know, polygamy is a bad idea. Um, doesn't work. All right, so, but the thing is, we should forgive people, but that doesn't mean we should allow them to continue hurting us. So he's doing these tests to see if they're still the same old brothers that they were before, okay? Um, so for example, I'm gonna bring it home. So think about if you have a family member who has hurt you, okay? And I don't wanna get into ways family hurts family, but we know some of the people that hurt us the most in life are family members and spouses, right? So if you have a family member who's hurt you, um, and you want to know, should I forgive them? And what does that mean? People don't understand what forgiveness means. I struggled with this for 25 years. What does forgiveness mean? I thought, one minute, okay. I thought that forgiveness meant we're supposed to, if the person is unremorseful, unrepentant, that we're supposed to let them back into our lives, embrace them with open arms, and let them to continue doing what they did. And I forgive you, but that's not what forgiveness means. So the definition of forgiveness is to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense or transgression against us. It also means to cancel a debt, and it means to renounce our right to revenge against the person. That's what forgiveness means. It doesn't mean, come on, Joseph's brothers, hurt me some more. Okay? Um, it doesn't mean that the person can still be harmful. Um, let's go to, um, I don't know, am I out of time? Go ahead. Okay. Matthew chapter 7. Somebody go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 18, 19, and 20. Matthew 7, 18, 19, and 20. And when you guys get it, go ahead and read it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 18, 19, and 20. 
Very good. So Nicole just read the verse in Matthew about a tree, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. So this directly relates to his brothers. He's looking to see have they been bearing bad fruit these decades that I haven't seen them, right? Okay. Um, I want to get to the divination cup and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna cut I'm gonna cut it. I want to get to the divination cup though, because I think this is really important for us as Christians. So Wednesday, June 15th, the divination cup. Okay, first of all, that's in Genesis 44. So I want to just let people who are watching know. So 43, they go back to Egypt with Benjamin. Jacob didn't want that to happen, okay? He's overjoyed to see Benjamin, but he has to keep his poker face on, right? And not let them know he's happy. He gives them a ton of food at a banquet table. They sit separately because of the caste system. So Egypt had very rigid caste systems. So they're not going to sit with these Semitic shepherds, right? Okay, but he can hear what they're talking about because he can speak Hebrew. All right, then they go back to Egypt and he put, I'm sorry, back to Canaan. He puts his silver divination cup at the bottom of Benjamin's sack of grain. Then he sends a steward chasing after them, go get them, he's got my cup, right? We know the story. Um, they come back, right, and they're freaking out. They're like, oh my goodness, this is our worst fears. Jacob's only son left from Rachel is probably going to be executed or imprisoned for stealing a cup, okay? So let's get into this. First of all, what is divination? Divination cup, what is divination? The, uh, the, the idea of divination is that uh, through uh, spiritual means or through occult today, we think through means of the occult, we can determine the future or we can decide, we can look into the past and mm -hmm. see reveal. Mm -hmm. Divination is a revealing of truth, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so it's the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural means. So in many cultures today, people read tea leaves. They put tea leaves in a cup or coffee granules in a cup, and that tells them about the future. So that's a divination cup. So Joseph had a silver divination cup. It doesn't necessarily mean he was using it for that purpose. Um, I know that in the Sabbath School lesson, they have a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 229. I'm going to actually, I'm going to disagree with Ellen White on something, and I'll probably get thrown out of the church after this. Um, so she's saying here, and I'm reading this directly from the Sabbath School lesson, that Joseph was using a divination cup did not mean that he believed in its power. Joseph had never claimed the power of div divination, but was willing to have him believe that he could read the secrets of their, of their lives. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 229. Here's why I don't agree with her. I think that if you have a close relationship with the Lord, you should not have to use deception or subterfuge. And you shouldn't have to use satanic means, because the divination cup is satanic, right? It's occultic, to get your point across to people. So even though he wasn't practicing it in his personal life, um, the fact of the matter is he was using something to get a greater point across, right? So. Um, he wanted to be sure his brothers had changed their characters and behavior, so he used deception. So I'm saying that as Christians, we shouldn't have to use deception or use something satanic to make a point. Right. Okay? We should not. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that there's a quote from Pastor Wentley Phipps, and the quote is, you don't have to compromise to be recognized. So he shouldn't have needed to compromise. Yeah, he's not... Sister White says he wasn't using the cup um, for its power. And I'm reading this from the Sabbath School lesson. I don't ever use her from the pulpit. I try not to. Um, but I'm going to disagree with her in the sense that he shouldn't have been using it to begin with to get his point across. So my question to you guys is how can we as Christians learn the truth about someone's character without compromising our principles? So if you're running into someone like a lawyer or a car salesman or a family member that you think might have unsavory character, how can we as Christians learn the truth about someone's character without compromising our morals? <laughs> how can, yeah, seriously, without compromising our, our what, what we believe is right, how can we learn about someone's character? Well, I'm the oldest of five kids, and I'm 
always running away from my brothers and sisters. Okay. So, well, I, I understand. Okay. So anybody, what can we do? Remain honest yourself. What did you say? Remain honest to yourself. Remain honest to yourself? Honest to yourself, yeah, in the presence of deception. Even when you know people are trying to be deceptive, it's, you know, you try to, you're talking about character, aren't you? Yeah, I'm talking about character, we're talking, absolutely. We're talking about self-control and the manifestation of these characters. Yeah. These characters. So I think those are some of the things we do when we know we're trying to be job, you know, we, we maintain a, 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 a a character of uh, an ethical character of uh, what is the right way of writing, so escaping. Okay. You know? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we shouldn't have to pretend to be psychics or clairvoyants or use pagan objects to make our point. We shouldn't have to do that. So um, the way that we, we can learn the truth about someone's character is to ask God, to ask God to reveal the person's character to us. There's been times in my life where I've met people who wasn't really sure if what they were saying was true, if they're lying to me, I couldn't tell because they were so good at lying. They were so convincing. They practiced it for so long. And I couldn't tell. I prayed and the Lord revealed to me, this person's lying to you. Okay? So we shouldn't have to use divination cups and use other things that we're not supposed to be using to get a point across. And I don't mean using like he wasn't practicing the occult. Joseph wasn't. But he was using occultic objects to scare, scare his brothers, right? He was in a robe. Yeah. He was playing a role. He was playing a role. And he shouldn't have needed to do that. Go ahead. Just so you know, the spirits when we pray in tongues and then you have the revelation knowledge from God to discern all these bad people. It's the gift of discernment. We're supposed to be asking God for discernment. We need it, right? Not everybody is our friend. Right. Okay. All right. We're going to close um, because of time. Yeah? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and end this right now. So it was really great to have you guys here. Happy Sabbath. And I'll go ahead and ask uh, Brother Ron, do you mind closing us out with a prayer? Father, well, we thank you for your goodness, mercies, and your love. We thank you that Sister Kylie was able to bring this dynamic Sabbath school lesson to her, to us today and her wonderful way of researching and dealing with uh, these lessons. We pray that the Holy Spirit will stay with us and that as we move into the services to come and that greater enlightenment in you of your word will come into come to us today. Be with us, keep us in your care, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
uh, who helps to get that ready, Sister uh, Sam. Shout out to Sister Sam. Uh, we're out early this morning getting the tent up. Amen? Well, not the tent, the, the table up. Getting the table right. <laughs> Get the table right. Uh, so, 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 so that when the people come, uh, they can know about the Pathfinder Club and Adventurer Club we will be starting. Uh, so we have a, a booth for that. Then we have uh, Sister Nett has her booth for the Benjamin Banneker Prep Academy. Uh, so they are out there advertising for that school. And then finally, we have Today's Youth Matter, uh, another youth organization helping the young people transition uh, from young adulthood to, to youth, to young adults, to uh, successful adults. Uh, and so I praise God uh, that the family of God here in Richmond at Beacon Light uh, is not quasi-involved. We probably have the most representation uh, of any uh, entity, any one entity uh, that I'm aware of in the community. So I'm proud of my people. Amen? Amen. Amen. So praise God. We are out there. We support them. And after service, um, I'm going to be heading almost immediately over there uh, to mingle, shake hands, meet and greet, and continue to invite uh, young people to join our Pathfinder and Adventure Club that we're going to be starting in August. Uh, so that is going on right now. Also, uh, family, uh, my family, uh, we're going we're gonna to take an official vacation. Amen? Uh, we're going to take an official vacation, and that is going to take place uh, beginning actually at midnight tonight. Uh, we're going to fly out of, of San Francisco Airport. Uh, we're going to fly to my dad's home, home country in Panama. We're going to lay over it there, and then we're going to fly to Dominican Republic. And we're going to be with my wife's family. Uh, but we're going to go to the beach for a little while. Amen. Amen. So I said, we're going we're gonna to do two. We're going to be in the beach, and then we're going to go to the barrio. Amen. Uh, so we're going to have a little vacation. We're going to spend some time with my wife's family. Uh, uh, two weeks, uh, uh, literally connecting with them. We haven't been able to see them for several years uh, due to the, the pandemic. And so praise God that those restrictions have lifted. Uh, it's a safe first, not the safest. We're still in the pandemic, but a safer situation uh, where we can actually go and do that. Uh, so for the next two weeks, and we'll be returning uh, on the on the 5th. We'll be returning on the 5th of July. Uh, so for the next two weeks, um, if there are any emergencies, if there are any uh, uh, urgent issues, and let me define urgent, right? Urgent meaning, God forbid, you know, somebody has passed away, right? Uh, uh, emergent meaning, you know, somebody is on their deathbed. Uh, please go ahead and reach out uh, to Pastor Pete, uh, also, Pastor Moy, uh, they will be able to help you uh, in, in situations like that. They'll be able to also contact me in the Dominican Republic. I'll be out of the country, uh, so it's not going to be easy to uh, contact or communicate with me. Uh, so, But if there are urgent or emergent issues, life and death stuff, uh, reach out to those brothers and they'll be able to get a hold of me. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Uh, next thing I wanted to bring our attention to uh, is um, uh, the July 5 through 8. Uh, I'm not even going to say it. Do we remember what is happening on July 5 through 8? Anybody remember that? All right. July 5 through 8. Anybody? All right. That's all right. Well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I didn't take it off my announcement. Uh, July 5 through 8, uh, Beacon Light, in conjunction with the conference and in conjunction with uh, Today's Youth Matter, we're having a free, well, almost free, a very inexpensive $25 per person, four-day day camp. And in the day camp, we're going to have rock walls. We're going to have all types of crafts, activities. We're going to have free lunch, and it's for the community. We have a lot of people in the community that have signed up, a lot of kids that have signed up, and we are going to be hosting that event. It will be at the Salesian Prep Academy, or Salesian High School. Um, so that's going to take place on July 5 through 8. Amen? Amen. So what, what, what we need are, are just a couple more volunteers. We need a couple more volunteers. And we need those volunteers specifically, individuals who can help uh, 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 sit at the booth that we're going to have 
at that day camp that represents our, our new Pathfinder and Adventurer Club. Literally, you will just sit at the booth, and if anybody asks any questions or has any uh, uh, concerns or, or wants to know more about the club, literally, you will just uh, 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 point them to the screen, you can write their name down, and we'll get back with them. Uh, we will give you instructions if you choose to volunteer at the booth uh, as to exactly what you need to say. Uh, but we do need a couple more people uh, to go ahead and sit at the booth uh, during our time uh, 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 in which we'll be advertising uh, for the starting of our Pathfinder and Adventurer group, which begins in August. So I don't know if y'all have caught on yet. I don't know if you caught on yet. Uh, but check this out. We have been doing a lot to promote our Pathfinder and Adventurer group. Uh, I believe that God works in mysterious ways, but one of the ways that he does not work in which is not mysterious is he works through us. In other words, there is a, a human divine partnership, amen? Uh, we put in the work, and then we trust God to bring the results. So what we've done at Beacon Light is we put in the work, all right? We have advertised and are still advertising uh, the activities we have. We will continue to advertise uh, the activities, the things we're doing. And then once we've done all we can do, Sister Michelle, we're going to trust God. We're going to trust God to bring the people he wants uh, in those programs uh, as we uh, start out anew and helping to rebuild or, or uh, uh, hold up our community to be the best it can be, specifically as it relates to our youth. Because we know if we get the youth, yeah. the adults will come. Amen? Uh, that's one thing my sister told me. She, she's a youth uh, expert. She said, if you take care of the kids, uh, the adults will come. Um, because if any time you, you love somebody's kid, as you do, Sister, sister uh, Shirley, uh, uh, the adults will respect it, uh, and they will continue to bring their children. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and that's why we've been advertising so diligently and consistently. Uh, because ultimately, bigger than Pathfinders, bigger than Adventurers, bigger than uh, 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 Benjamin Banneker Prep, uh, the ultimate thing we're trying to do is introduce children to Jesus Christ. Amen. Introduce parents to Jesus Christ. Because we know, we don't think, we know that having Christ in our lives will be transformative uh, uh, and, and redemptive for not only here on earth, but also in the earth hereafter. So we're going hard for the kids. Uh, we're going hard for the adults. And ultimately, we're going hard for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I want to go ahead and, and uh, I think that does it all for me. Uh, that should do it all for me in terms of the announcements today. Uh, family, Okay, amen, amen, amen. Uh, so family, uh, we are going to go ahead and have our praise and worship. And right after praise and worship, there is a special presentation. A special presentation we're going to have um, uh, for, our, uh, for our graduates, amen? Uh, so praise and worship, and immediately after that, uh, we will have a special presentation for our graduates. Thank you, Michelle. Are you blessed today? I'm blessed today. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed when I come and when I go. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the field. Won't you stand with me if you can? Let's sing about this blessed song. Oh! 
I'm so thankful to be here one more time. God spared our lives once again so that we could give him glory, praise, and honor. But I fell in love with Jesus a long time ago. And I know that it was the best thing that I could have ever done in my life. Falling in love with Jesus. Yes, God. Woo, falling in love. Yes, God. The best thing that ever happened to me.
have mercy. Hey, y'all, she wasn't, she wasn't singing to us. Don't get it twisted. She was singing to the lover of her soul. Amen. I was blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sister. Amen. Our family, we are blessed. Amen. We are blessed uh, because uh, Beacon Light uh, is a church of many, many, uh, many people, and we all value education. Amen. I know I spoke to the church, I want to say about two weeks ago, uh, and uh, the graduation list I had at the time uh, was incomplete, incomplete, amen? Uh, and it was brought to my attention, it said, Brother Pastor David, we have some more uh, folk uh, that have graduated, amen? Uh, we have some more individuals that have graduated, and we want to recognize all of our graduates. And so we have prepared uh, a video presentation uh, that celebrates and commemorates uh, those who have graduated from kindergarten, amen, yeah. eighth grade, amen, and high school, amen. Uh, Brother Jericho, you going to San Diego State, is it? UC San Diego. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, that's the big school. Amen, amen, amen. Have fun, but not too much fun, brother. Amen. Mama said amen, amen, Pastor. Amen. So family, we're going to go ahead. We're going to play a short video um, as we honor uh, our graduates. Uh, we salute you all. Um, please enjoy the video.
Marvin Singleton, and it is an honor to have the opportunity to speak at our promotion ceremony. I stand here before you, looking back on two years of many memories that we have all made. We have made it all together. Congratulations to the class of 2022 and to the parents who were always supporting their children and sacrificing themselves for them. My mom and dad and my whole family have been very supportive of everything I've done. And thank you for thank you to all the teachers. They may not be frontliners, but they are essential and they're the backbone to society's education. Also, let us not forget from us to middle school and this building, which grounds basic basic life skills and provides formal education to the children. During the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of things changed. Many families faced different difficulties, especially during the first quarter of it. For us, it was online class. I don't think anyone enjoyed it, but we had to deal with it. After that, we have this year, which started off pretty weird with masks and stuff. But I'm pretty sure I'm pretty used to it. I started off the year making new friends and joining the school basketball team and winning a trophy, trophy with them. Now after months of work and hardship, we're here today. We are one more day from finishing middle school and we're now soon off to high school. The journey ahead may not be easy and most of us will stumble at some point. But the important thing is that we get back up and keep working towards our goals and dreams. We need to make sure to stay true to ourselves and not lose our way. A way we can do this is by thinking about our loved ones and wishing the best for them. If you can't find anyone to love, just love yourself. We need to remember that we have been through so much. We have been through hardships personally and worldwide with this pandemic. But we're here right now, still pushing. Now, all we gotta do is keep the same energy moving forward. And as the next generation, even though we, not, we might not want to, we're going to have to improve the world we live in and start taking action. Not just by cleaning Earth itself, but creating a better society. We've seen the news of these mass shootings. We can't keep letting these, these things happen. We're going to have to step up and stand up for what we think is right. That's all i got to say. Thank you so much. church, right? It's a safe place for them to learn, right? Brother Marvin has been doing that all that my time here at Beacon Light, I'm sure before that. So he's been, him and his sister Gretchen have been getting up here. Uh, I was a little nervous at first, the confidence started to come. Then we went into the pandemic, and then they, hey, when the lights came on, they came on. Uh, they look like they would work for Bay Area Channel 4. And, 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 and when I saw that video, family, I'm telling you, I said, that's what happens. That's what happens uh, when we bring our kids to church. You know, when we involve them in, in, in activities where they can grow in a safe place. That speech doesn't happen on its own. It was uh, 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 months and months of practice. Uh, months and months of teaching, Sister Shushi, Sister Bob. It's the family of God that made that, man. So, Greg, uh, uh, we're just proud of you, brother. Marvin, you do fantastic work. And when I saw that, uh, I was proud, man. But more than being proud, I was proud of you all for having a milieu, a society, a community in which these young folks can grow, learn, get more confidence as they keep coming up here. Uh, that way, when it's prime time, when it's time for them to do it in the community, in the world, they ready. And so you did a good job, brother. Were you even nervous, bro? Now he's doing his thing, see? He was doing his thing. Amen. Amen. So give our graduates a hand. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, want, I want our graduates to come forward. I want, I want uh, uh, brother, I'm sorry, Master Jabari. Master Jabari, we got something for you from your church. Amen. 
I'm going to stay up, stay, stay up here. Uh, uh, doctor, or almost doctor, uh, Pastor Peterson. We got something for you. Amen. Uh, 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 Sister Kim Pitters, I know you're not here. We're going to get this to you a little later on. Uh, Jericho. Amen. 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 UC San Diego. UC San Diego. Come on up, brother. Uh, brother Jericho. Uh, then we got Brother Marvin Singleton. Brother Marvin Singleton coming on uh, 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 from, 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 uh, uh, from eighth grade, about to start high school. And then we got the youngster. Come on. Come on, little Ethan. Hey, Amen. Little Ethan, come on up. Come on up. Amen. Hey, 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 Marvin, Ethan got next. <laughs> Ethan got next. He walked up here like he a preacher. All right, we see you, Ethan. We see you. Uh, so, family, we praise God. We praise God uh, for these graduates. Uh, it's all brothers, huh? All the fellas today, okay? Uh, 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 amen. All the brothers are representing, so uh, we praise God for you all. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, little Ethan, uh, and then my man's going to San Diego, uh, they may be moving out of town, so I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to see them. Uh, so we love y'all, man. Uh, you can leave us, but y'all can know. Oh. Ain't living forever, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, so we're proud of y'all, man. Always in there, you got to always be in our prayers. Uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, we got, we got, we got something for everybody. Little, little Ethan got his thing in Sabbath school, no? You got a little Sabbath school gift for little Ethan, amen. Uh, man, we also got something for Ethan. We'll get your address and mail it to him. But I want to pass these out for the Marvin. All right. Uh, Brother Jericho. Thank you. Sir. And Jericho was speaking at our, our Youth Week of Prayer. Oh, yeah, man. We remember. Hey, man. We remember. Uh, Pastor Pete. Hey, y'all give it up for Pastor Pete. Hey, man. Who was instrumental in helping these young men and young women to grow into the full individual that God would have them to be. Shout out to you, Pastor Pete. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> he said, he can, everything's good. He just can't grow no more, brother. You get, get too tall. Uh, then we are uh, Master Jabari. Amen. 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 So we're going to keep praying for my brother. He got the graduation. Now he's preparing for the last test, right? In two weeks. Uh, so we're going to be praying. We'll pray for you now uh, as he prepares for that test. Uh, to complete his credentialing uh, uh, to be a master educator uh, for uh, the special ed. And we got a little something for you too, Ethan. Don't, don't think we forgot you. Got something for you. We have to mail it to you though. Um, and you got something in Sabbath school as well. Uh, so shout out also, come on, Barbara and Shushy, don't wave your hands. Shout out to our Sabbath school teachers, Barbara and Shushy, amen. Our instrumental and helping our kids to grow. Shout out to all the parents out there too. Uh, raising fine young men. We know it's tough. It's tough on young men in this society. Uh, but God has been so faithful to us, allow these young brothers to graduate. Uh, and we praise God for it, amen? amen. So family, please join me uh, as we have a prayer. Let me get out the way. Let me get out the way. If y'all wanna take pictures, I'm standing in the way. Uh, so everybody can be seen. Um, uh, but let's have a, a, a word of, of prayer, um, and then we can have um, parents, if y'all want to take any photos, we can do that. Uh, but we want to have a prayer of, of dedication, uh, a prayer of renewal, a prayer of encouragement, a prayer of God's presence over these brothers. Uh, so family, let's bow our heads. Uh, Lord God, uh, you've been faithful, you've been good. Uh, from uh, kindergarten all the way up through our master's degree. Uh, Lord God, we know that true wisdom comes from you. And so, Lord God, we're just grateful, Lord God, uh, that you had all these brothers complete their various stages of education, Lord God. Uh, but, Father, to be educated uh, and not useful in society is useless. And so, Lord God, I pray, as Martin Luther King say, said, that they would be great. And greatness essentially means that they would be men dedicated to serving God and serving people. Uh, so Lord God, thank you for them. Lead them, guide them, fill them, and just be with them as they continue on in life. Uh, we wanna have a special prayer uh, for my man Jabari. Uh, Lord God, as he's preparing 
uh, for his credentialing test. Uh, Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would endow him with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding uh, so that he can pass it the first time. Uh, Lord God, just bless him to that end. Uh, also, I want to pray uh, for the homie Jericho. Uh, Lord God, he's going into college. Lord God, we know there's a, a million and one temptations, a million and one distractions, a million and one challenges that await him. And so, Lord God, I pray he finds himself reading the Bible every day, on his knees, day, on his knees praying to you. And Lord God, that he might maneuver in such a way that folk know his brother's different. Uh, he's connected to something special, something higher. And Lord God, that he might shine for you uh, on that secular campus, Lord God. So just be with my brother in a special way, Lord God. Uh, Lord God, also my man Marvin, as he's going to high school, protect him, Lord. He's already been a, a light in eighth grade, helping me even more so uh, as he enters into high school, Lord God. May that transition be smooth and seamless. Uh, young Ethan, Lord, as he's going to first grade, we thank you for him, Lord God. Be with him in the journey. Little, little preacher man walking up here bold. Lord God, thank you for my little man. Bless him, people, Lord God. Uh, Lord God, also, uh, the brother who's really the shepherd of our youth, uh, Pastor Peterson, Lord God. We thank you for him. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you for his leadership. We thank you for his love, care, and concern that he always pours out, especially on the youth. Uh, Lord, so continue to watch over, bless, and keep him. Lord, we pray a blessing on all the parents. Because without the parents, this, this, this don't happen. So, Lord God, we ask you to bless every parent uh, uh, that, is, that is represented here by their children. Uh, continue to watch over, bless, and keep them. Ultimately, Lord God, we, we commit these individuals to you. And we thank you, Lord God, for what you will do for them and what you've already done for them. And all this we pray and we thank and we ask in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen. 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 Family, if y'all want to take any pictures, any more pictures, pass me. They said they, they, if we can, well, we can keep it cold. Yes. Amen. gym one time a few weeks ago. I ain't seen him since. <laughs> he was in Crocs and everything. Uh, and then little Ethan, good job. With the Tesla shirt in the picture, I see you. They ain't even had a Tesla when I was your age. Nobody knew what that was yet. And then uh, Marvin, good job on the speech. Cracked some jokes. Talked about the teachers. Talked about some tough subjects. It was a powerful, uh, powerful little speech. Uh, so now it's time for our prayer wall. And I was thinking earlier, I remember that, that, that I remember now that I'm living today, living in today, things that I prayed for in the past, right? So this prayer wall, it's kind of like a life business plan. It's just a, a five year plan. And so, a lot of the prayers that I have prayed in the past, I'm living today. We ought to forget like, how many times God answers prayer for us, right? How many times God is good to write it down, to see God move, see how God has moved in your life. Build your faith up. And so we have three sections here. We have a yes section. We have a no section. And we have a wait section. And then we have some prayers sitting in the queue, waiting to be located into its uh, place. So there's a lot of prayers up there um, that I'm praying that get answered in one way or another. So if, you, if you've written a prayer up there, I, I pray that you continue to pray for that prayer until you get an answer. So it doesn't just sit in the section uh, where it's uncategorized. Right? And these prayers that you put up here, we pray for every day. The church prays for every day in, separate, in various meetings and, and whatnot. Uh, so at this time, it is time for you to come up, grab a piece of paper, and grab a pen to write your prayer request 
and then go back to your seat. So if you would like to put up a prayer for the prayer wall, come up and grab a piece of paper and a pen up here, and then go back to your seats, and there will be a time later for you to come and pin your prayer request on the wall, or to change, put your prayer into a yes, no, or a wait section. So I'll give you a few minutes. If you have a prayer request, come up, get you a piece of paper, get you a pencil, and go back to your seat, please.
with love. Father God, may we experience your love today. I'm going to pray for the, the, the speaker. I'm going to pray for the pastor. That as your word goes forth, that it would not return void. That those listening, that those hearing would, would become changed by your word. They would become evicted on, convicted on what steps to take next to carry out your will and your way. We ask that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Luke 7, verse 18. Today's scripture reading is Luke 7, verse 18 through 35. Luke chapter 7, verse 18 through 35. Luke chapter 7, verse 18 through 35. Now I'll be reading from the Greek. Just playing. New King James. I'll be reading from the New King James. <laughs> yeah, nobody paying attention, huh? I was reading the Greek. Everybody is okay. Luke chapter 7, verse 18 through 35. The, the word of the Lord says, Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the man had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Verse 21, In that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Verse 24, When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who you will prepare your way, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Verse 29. And, all, and when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drink, drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Verse 35, But wisdom is justified by all her children. May God add a blessing to the hearer and doer of his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that reading and rendering of the word of God. Good to see you, my brother. Amen. Amen. Family, it is now time for tithe and offering. Uh, for those who are online, uh, we invite you to uh, contribute uh, on our website, 
uh, BeaconLifeSDAChurch.com. Uh, that's BeaconLifeSDAChurch.com. Uh, there, just go to the online giving uh, icon, and you'll be able to return your tithe and offerings there. Uh, family, we had board meeting this past Thursday night, and we are a little less uh, than what we are normally budgeted for for the month. Uh, so I just want to encourage us all to remember to be faithful to the cause and the needs of the church. Amen? Amen. Uh, we, we, we praise God for what he's done. He's been good to us all year. But let's just remember to be faithful, uh, specifically in our tithe and offering, as it feeds all the ministries that we involve, involve ourselves in. And we are involved in a lot. I like to say we are a modest church that is making a mega impact, amen? And in order to make that impact, we need uh, uh, the, 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 the faithfulness of the saints, uh, specifically as it relates to tithe and offering. Uh, when you bring your tithe and offering up, you are uh, welcome at that time to go ahead and place your request on the prayer board. As Pastor Ryan already mentioned, these requests are not just prayed for during church. They're prayed for all during the week. Uh, we actually have some people that call in and say, Pastor, I want you to put a request on the board for me. Uh, so we're putting requests, email, text, telephone call, any request that comes, we put it on the board uh, because we believe that God answers prayer. Uh, so immediately following uh, prayer, I invite everybody to go ahead and return their tithe and offering. Uh, uh, you can put it in the basket here. And then if you also have a prayer request, you can go ahead and place it on the board. Pastor Pete, I was noticing something. Uh, we got a lot of requests. Uh, we have a, a, a decent amount of yeses, um, but there's no no's. I don't know about you. I say praise God. Amen. 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 Isn't it good when God answers your prayer? Yes. Amen. So I pray praise God for that. And then we got a couple of weights as well. So I encourage us all, uh, go ahead and put your prayer requests on the board. Um, as uh, the musicians play, as we get ready to have or collect uh, God's tithes and offerings. Uh, come on, well, I want to give a, a shout out to Pastor, uh, Brother Marcus, amen. amen. Music team, y'all like that prayer song? Y'all yeah. like that prayer song? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. So thank you all for getting that. That was nice, that was nice. So family, uh, right before we uh, have our tithe and offering, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord, you've been so very good. Uh, Lord God, we just praise your name. Uh, Lord God, be with us as we return your tithe and your offering. We thank you in advance. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.
Lord, we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. you to ask God to just give me you. I don't want to be too late. Give me you. Everything else can wait. Give me you. I hope I'm not too late. Lord, Oh! 
is God that it's not too late. Amen? It's not too late. God is still available. Uh, and he's in this place right now. Lord God, we thank you for all that you do and who you are. We need more of your spirit to be with us now. So bless us and keep us as only you can. Lord God, give us a word, a rhema word, in due season now. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, family. I praise God for the opportunity to look again at the book of Luke. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I need you to turn to Luke chapter 7. Uh, Luke chapter 7, I want you to turn there with me now as we consider uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 38 through, excuse me, at verse 18 through 35. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. Uh, this particular chapter, first of all, do you have, if you have it, say amen. Amen, amen. This is an interesting chapter, Brother D. Uh, because when I looked at this chapter, and I looked at it in its relation to the previous study we had, there is an interesting corollary uh, that God will reveal to us today. If we remember, for those who were not here, uh, last week we looked at the story of when Jesus went to a city called Nain. And while in the city of Nain, uh, there was a funeral going on. But as is not often, but as is always the case, whenever Jesus shows up to a funeral, it ceases being a funeral, amen? Uh, it turns into a party of epic proportion. So the Bible told us that Jesus went into the city of Nain and he ran into a random woman. The Bible doesn't even give her name. And, and he saw that this woman had lost her only son and she was already a widow. Then Jesus went ahead and, and stopped the crying, stopped the funeral, touched uh, 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 the casket, and resurrected the child. Amen? Uh, the Bible then says that just as surely as he resurrected the child and uh, just as, as inconspicuously that he entered into the city, he exited the same way. He didn't ask that woman to come and follow me. He didn't tell that woman he was the Messiah, the Son of God. The Bible says he resurrected her, uh, that child, unanimously uh, 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 and, uh, and, and, and left the scene without causing a fuss. And so we saw in that particular passage that we read last week that God disrupts us in order to bless us. And in disrupting us, sometimes we see that blessing instantaneously. Did we not learn that last week? Sometimes when God interrupts, there's an immediate resurrection and we can all say hallelujah. But when we look a little further in Luke chapter 7, particularly verses 18 through 35, we see a different experience. Because when we look at Luke 18, verse, Luke 7, verses 18 through 35, we encounter for the, for, for, for the second time a, a man by the name of John. The Bible says in Luke chapter 7, verse 18, that at this point in John's life, John is in jail. Lord have mercy. The Bible tells us that John was the first person to herald the coming of the Messiah. He said, he said that, 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 that Jesus was the Messiah before anybody else began to proclaim him. But the Bible also tells us that not only was he the first proclaimer of Jesus being the uh, Messiah, he was the first person to go to jail for accepting Jesus in his life. And so far here we find J 
John in an unusual and a precarious situation. The Bible says in Luke chapter 7, verse 18, it says, John's disciples told him, that is, they told John about all these things. What are these things? These things are the things that we studied about last week, about Jesus resurrecting uh, 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 that child, about Jesus healing and Jesus doing many miracles. It says that John's disciples told him about all things, calling two of them. John sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Lord have mercy. I declare that everybody who comes to visit you when you're in a, a bad situation, they don't always do the best job at comforting you. Amen? Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been sick or uh, uh, ever, ever, ever been, been, been in a situation where uh, uh, things weren't going well for you and, and you encounter somebody who, who, who's there to comfort you, uh, but instead of comforting you, they make things demonstrably worse. Lord have mercy. The Bible says that in our mouths, in our tongues, we have the ability to speak life and or death to somebody. So what happens is sometimes and inadvertently when we, when we go to encourage people, we can actually end up uh, accidentally making their situation worse. And so I imagine that uh, as John's disciples came to, to see Jesus, I, to see John, I can imagine them going to the jail and, and, and taking their time as they made their visitation with the prisoner. And as they went and saw John, I, 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 I would imagine that, that things went a little like this. So John, John, I, 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 I hope you're doing well in jail. John, John says, oh, things are going all right. Things are going all right. Then they would say, well, John, we, 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 we've just come to tell you about that Jesus that, that, that you were proclaiming, that you told us all about. Uh, uh, we just want to let you know what's going on with him uh, because... Because what we've been noticed is, is he is a powerful preacher, isn't he? He's a powerful preacher. And I can imagine John nodding his head. Yes. And, 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 and John, you know, you said that, that, that he is a, the one that you are not even worthy to take off his shoes. He's a special man. A lot of people are following him, John. And John would nod his head in agreement. And, and, and then they would, they, they would also add, but you know, you know John, that Jesus does strange things. You see that Jesus, he often finds himself uh, at parties, at weddings, at, 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 at social events, not, not just social events, but social events when some, some sketchy characters are present. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard, I, I wasn't there, but I heard that one of the parties, uh, a lady of the night uh, was one of the honored guests. I, I, that's just what I heard. And then, I, I wasn't there, John, but, but I also heard that at one of the parties, it was actually thrown uh, uh, by uh, one of the traitors of our people. It was thrown by a publican and a tax collector. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus attended that. And you know, John, John, I don't want to discourage it. I, I'm not trying to, to make things or, matter of fact, forget what I told you, John. I, I'm just reporting what I heard. And so here it is, John sitting in prison. In a situation he's highly not only uncomfortable with, but unusual with the circumstances. We remember that John was a man of the outdoors. The Bible says he was so outdoorsy that he didn't just go camping, he lived out in the wilderness. A matter of fact, if if John was here today, he could host his own episode of Man vs. Wild. Uh, he, the Bible says that John ate wild honey and he ate locusts. And, 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 and if you saw John, there was nothing nice or nothing fresh or clean or nothing popping about John. John wore camel's hair clothing, right? 
So Jonah was a, a distinctive individual who had a, 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 an unusual way of doing things. He didn't care for the limelight. He just wanted to preach the word of God and then go back into the wilderness. And so here is John and John's disciples are experiencing this type, Lord have mercy, this type of ministry. And, and, and because the ministry that Jesus is involved in doesn't uh, particularly fit the type of ministry that they're used to, used to they question the authenticity, authenticity of Jesus' ministry. Not because of the content of Christ's ministry, but the way he did his ministry. John, if you will, was a austere, erect, a call it like you see it, a no holds bars, a straight shooter, that doesn't care about societal norms. He just preaches the word of God. Whereas Jesus is a little more laid back. I don't know, I seem a little bit, a little bit more like Pastor Pete. Uh, Jesus probably had on some decent clothes. Uh, Jesus had no problem mingling with folk and going about the city, and he didn't care what folk thought about him, so his company was, was questionable at best. Jesus was different. So John's disciples said, this, this man, Jesus, that you proclaimed, John, he's healing everybody, uh, he's helping people, he's doing all these miracles, uh, uh, but John, I, I, I don't mean to discourage you. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, to to put you in a mental bad place by, by telling you this. But John, he's done all these things for everybody else. But you're still stuck in prison. I, 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 that's just, that's, I'm, just forget what I said. I, I just forget what I said, John. I, I just don't understand how those two comport. You, you, you're the one who proclaimed them. You're the first one who said he's the Messiah, and he's doing all these things for other people, but he ain't doing nothing for you, John. I'm just saying what's happening, John. And so the Bible says that as they reported these things to John, these things got in John's head. Lord have mercy. We need to be careful who we lend our ear to. Those individuals in whom we choose to listen to, they influence us directly and many times in a deeper way than we can really imagine or actually know. And so as this report about John came, about Jesus came to the ears of John, the Bible says that something happened with John. Something disturbing, if you ask me. The Bible says that after hearing this report, and because John was in an unusual and uncomfortable environment and the prison experience began to get to John, uh, the Bible declared, Lord have mercy, that even the stalwart that was John the Baptist began to experience doubt. This man, John, who from a child before his birth had the Holy Spirit in his heart and his soul, this man, John, who was born to a woman who should never have had kids, she was too old, and to a husband to, who should have never been able to make a woman have kids, this same John, whose sole purpose was to declare that Jesus is the Son of God, this same John is now questioning and doubting if he got it work, if he got it right. What for me is amazing and amazingly shocking about John's question is when we know who John was, we remember it was John that said to Jesus when he was coming to be baptized, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that after John baptized him, it was John who saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove land on Jesus' head. It was John who heard God the Father audibly speak, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This same John is now doubting. Is this Christianity thing really all that I initially thought it was? Did I get it wrong? Family, I declare, 
if we're not prayerful and careful, if we're not a uh, 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 judicious and, and mindful, uh, uh, our current uh, trials will have a way of erasing all of the, 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 the proofs, all of the experiences, all of the, 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 the benefits, all of the things and the times that God has brought us through where we knew that God was on our side. If we're not careful, our, tri our current trials can have us forget all those things that God had done for us in the past. I declare we need to remember where God has brought us from. But unfortunately, John, like myself and like you all, was a human being. The Bible says something very interesting. The Bible says when, when John's disciples came and spoke to Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus did not answer them. Matter of fact, the Bible just said, that Jesus began to heal people and began to uh, teach people and began to preach to the poor and began to do those things that only Jesus does. The Bible says uh, that Jesus had very pointed words uh, for, for John. In verse 22, the Bible says, so Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John. Lord have mercy. Somebody say John. Amen. If you have your Bible, if you don't have your Bible, you really want to turn to it because it's about to get interesting. It said, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The Bible said, you need to go and tell who? John those things. That's what Jesus said. Go back and tell John those things have happened and that the good news is proclaimed to the poor. But this is where it gets personal. God had to encourage John in prison, and God is going to encourage you in verse 23. Verse 23 says something interesting. Because at the beginning of this whole pericope, of this whole passage, it's all about John, and John's doubt, and John being in prison, and John's uh, 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 struggle and John's trial. But verse 23, because Jesus is God and knows us, in verse 23, Jesus speaks prophetically to both you and me. Here it is. The Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, and blessed is what? What's that next word? He. he. And blessed is, New International Version says, anyone. He is a, a neutral, gender neutral term. He means everybody. Lord have mercy. The Bible says, and blessed is he, blessed is she, blessed is the boy, blessed is the girl, the man, the woman, and blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I love how the New International, New Living Translation says it. And it says, and he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. The English Standard Version says, and blessed is the one who will not be offended by me. Uh, the Contemporary English Version says, God will bless everyone who doesn't reject me because of what I do. Uh, the the Roby Rhymes Bible says, and blessed is he, whoever shall be shall not be scandalized in me. Lord have mercy. Bible says that Jesus first was preaching and talking to John, but then in verse 23, he started talking to you and to me. Bible says, uh, 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 we're blessed, mercy, we're blessed. If we're not, if we don't become scandalized, we're blessed if we don't become discouraged. We're blessed uh, if we are not offended by the things that Jesus does to us. Jesus will do some things to us that if we're not careful, will cause us to do an about face on Jesus and walk right away. 
That's what 20, verse 23 is saying. The, the, the life of John, Lord have mercy. It's interesting, Nolan. It's interesting because we just saw in the first, first, first uh, 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 chapter, verse 11 through 17, we saw a story where Jesus uh, uh, offended a woman, right? He disrespected her, and she immediately saw the reason why God allowed her funeral to be disrupted and interrupted because he had resurrection on his mind. In the life of John, Jesus says that there's going to be some things and some times in our life that God will allow us to experience that if we're not careful, we will turn our backs on him. Blessed are you if you're not scandalized when I take you to a place you didn't want to go. That's the story of John. That's the, the story of, 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 of this chapter that is instructive for you and for me. You see, what happens is, what happens is, uh, uh, sometimes if we're not careful, uh, we can actually, we can actually begin to uh, 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 have, have, a, have, a, have a messed up uh, a view of faith. You see, right in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33, uh, the Bible says that uh, uh, through faith, uh, they conquered kingdoms and they administered justice and they gained what was promised. Uh, they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched fiery flames, they escaped the edge of the sword. Uh, those uh, whose weakness they were turned to strength, they, they became powerful in battle through faith. They routed foreign enemies. Uh, women received their child back from the dead uh, and they were raised again. And we say, hallelujah, it pays to have faith in God. It pays uh, uh, to, to, to maintain uh, uh, your walk with God because I've done seen some things. I declare that, 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 that faith will cause you to have a three Hebrew boys experience. Because sometimes in, in faith, it will, it will allow you to walk through fiery fires. And, and sometimes uh, our faith will be like Daniel. It will cause a, a lion's mouth to close our our faith will, 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 will be uh, how it's to be like David. It will cause us to kill giants. That's the outspring or the outgrowth or the result of holding on to your faith. But there's a whole other side of this faith thing that John's life and Jesus specifically pointed out to us today. Jesus said, blessed are you when you are not scandalized when you do not turn away from me, when you are not offended by what I allow you to experience. The same faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35 says, but there were also some, uh, 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 there were others who were tortured, refusing to be, uh, uh, re refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeerings and floggings, and even chains and imprisonments. Uh, they were put to death by stoning. You hear me? Their faith caused them to be sawed in half. Lord have mercy. I don't know about you. If you're going to kill me, don't saw me to death. Amen? Just give me with a sword. The Bible says that these brothers and sisters were sawed in half as a result of their faith. Then the Bible says, the world was not worthy of these individuals. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for what? For their faith. Jesus said, blessed are you if you are not offended by what I allow you to experience. I love the last part of this. You see in verse 39 it says, yet none of them received what had been promised. Jesus. Family, this thing does not end well for John. Jesus does not come to John's rescue. Jesus does not open the gates of the prison like he did for Paul. Jesus doesn't have a miraculous, powerful, hallelujah, won't he do it, ending for John. The Bible says at the end of John's life, John's faith caused him 
to get his head locked up and ended his ministry in infamy. Jesus says, because of his faith and because of some things that God will allow us to experience, Jesus said that we will be blessed if we don't allow those things that God allows us to experience to cause us to do an about faith on everything God. The Bible goes on to say something very interesting. The Bible says something interesting, and, and after John, Jesus uh, told John's disciples, tell John essentially, you know what God has told you in the past. I know you're going through a dark season. Hold your head up, John. Don't forget what you knew to be true. It's still true. You just got to go through it. Be strong, John. The judge, Jesus gave John those words of encouragement. The Bible says that, that then Jesus turned to the crowd and he commended John. He said, John's a soldier, family. John's a real one. John, 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 John is one of the greatest prophets this world has ever seen. And, and he said, he said, he said, he said, uh, John has a different experience, a different ending that I caused for John. John's going to be all right but it's not going to seem okay in the meantime. The Bible says there's something else that happened. The Bible says that Jesus said something in, in verse 30. And when Jesus said this in verse 30, uh, something interesting happened in the preceding verses. Jesus began to talk about how the scribes and the Pharisees refused to believe in Jesus, right? They refused to believe in Jesus. They had been given a perfect example of righteousness in Jesus Christ, and they had been given an excellent example of godliness in John, but because they didn't like the content of those two people's message, namely repentance, the Bible says that the, the Pharisees and the scribes never uh, declared their allegiance to Christ. Verse 30 was, uh, says it uh, a little bit more plainly. Verse 30 says, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves. Why? Because they had not been baptized by John. Family, I got a quiz. John's baptism was a baptism of what? Baptism of water. What was the purpose of John's baptism? There it is. The baptism of repentance. Lord have mercy. When John preached, he won't try to build no church. When John evangelized, he wasn't trying to uh, exalt and, and get more people to follow him. When John did what he did, his sole purpose was, call, was to call people to a life of repentance. That's it. Don't come up. Don't come up and, and give me your name and, and join the church and, and start a ministry. None of that. All I want you to do is repent and be right with God. That was God's sole mission but the Bible says, because the scribes and Pharisees were so arrogant, they felt they had no need of repentance. They flat out rejected John, and they rejected Jesus. And I, when I think about this, it makes me think about the word purpose that Jesus uses. And I believe he uses the word purpose on purpose. Uh, because what we look for in life is a reason for living, amen? Uh, many people are, have, have uh, uh, committed suicide because they have no purpose. Uh, many people are, 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 are doing well in life, but they're empty inside because they have no purpose. Uh, one of the most best known and best written books is The Purpose Driven Life. The Bible declares that the purpose of John's ministry and indeed the purpose of Christ's ministry was to get us back in right relationship with God. We don't get back in a right relationship with God without first acknowledging, I'm a sinner. I need repentance. So the Bible says that, 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 John, that, 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 that John preached repentance, but because the people didn't want to hear it, and they rejected God's purpose in their lives, they refused to repent. And I love what the Bible says here. I love what the Bible says here, uh, because what the truth of the matter in this situation is, 
the purpose that John had for his life and the purpose that Jesus proclaimed uh, in his ministry is the same purpose that we experience today. In other words, the reason we're out here and in the audience today, the reason people are watching online today is not just to gain inspiration, right? It's just not to make us feel good, amen? It's not because y'all ain't got nothing else to do, right? The purpose, primary purpose for church, for preaching, for teaching is to get individuals into right alignment with Jesus Christ and with God the Father, and that only takes place through repentance. Let's check it out. Uh, 2 Peter, verse 3 through 9, it says, uh, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wants everyone to come to repentance. That's your purpose. That's my purpose. I'm not to ever get to a place where I feel I am immune from repentance. I got it going on to the point that I no longer need grace. The purpose of God, the purpose of John's ministry, of Jesus' ministry, and of our lives is to maintain right relationship with God through a life of repentance. But everybody don't like repentance. Some of the biggest mega churches out there don't even preach or say the word sin, much less you got to turn from sin. But Jesus said, John said, that we need to live a life of repentance. Some things in our lives that we know to be wrong, Jesus said, I need you to turn from that, to repent of that, to acknowledge your fault in that. That's your purpose in life, to be in a right relationship with God via repentance. Then after we've repented, then God can start talking to you about all those other things. Your career. Alright? Where, 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 where are you going to get your next meal? Alright? Where are you going to work next? Right? Uh, 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 whatever other things that uh, occupy our mind, that's not our purpose, nor is it the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose is first to get us right with God. And then once we're right with God, then God reveals the rest to us. Amen? So I love this thing, how it ends. I love this thing, how it ends. The Bible says clearly uh, that, 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 that anybody who comes to Jesus will not be cast out, right? The Bible is clear that Jesus came uh, not to condemn but to save the world. The, the Bible is clear that, 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 that the prompting and the working of the Holy Spirit is to draw uh, us to Christ. The Bible is clear. It says, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, you have not moved beyond the, the, the point in which you are no longer able to repent. Right? If you're here right now, if you're listening to me right now, your purpose still remains and then it's up to us to fulfill that purpose. To get our lives in right alignment with Jesus Christ. And I praise God for the ministry of John. I praise God for the teachings of Jesus Christ that tells us wherever we're at in life, we need to align with our purpose. The Bible says it like this. And then I'm going to sit down and leave y'all alone. It said, I've shown you, old man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? He says, but to walk humbly with your God, right? Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us that true religion undefiled is to recognize our state, our situation in relation to that uh, 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 of God. And that when we recognize God is holy and we're not, we walk humbly. We are eager to repent. We are uh, uh, willing to maintain our lives in right alignment with the things of God. Amen? Because we have a humble, repentant spirit. Anybody believe the word of God? Anybody want to have the teachings of God more than teachings, but a part of our lifestyle? Anybody tired of saying no to God when he convicts us of wrong? 
Anybody tired of having the scribes and the Pharisees' spirit and refusing to repent? I don't know about you, but I want a humble spirit. I want a teachable spirit. I want a repenting spirit. I don't want to be offended when Jesus takes me places I don't want to go. I want to walk humbly with my God. And as I walk humbly with my God, God says he will, he will, he will take my life and make something beautiful of it. I don't know. I don't know if my life is going to live uh, 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 several other years and, and become an old man and gray hair and, and live out the rest of my days uh, 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 with joy and pleasantness, or if God has it for me uh, to be like John, to suffer and die for Jesus. Uh, but the beautiful thing is, wherever God would have me, that's where I should be. And wherever God has placed you, that's where you should be. earth is not our home. Some of us will have great lives. Some of our lives will be jacked up. But the Bible says if we hold on to Christ and maintain a spirit of repentance, a, a, of correct alignment with Jesus, no matter what we experience, the Bible says when he comes back, we're going to walk with him. When he comes back, we're going to reign with him. When he comes back, we're going to meet him in peace. And I don't know about you, but by the grace of God, I'm asking God to give me a spirit of humility to accept whatever God has for me and to walk right in it. When trials come, to remember that the same God who brought me through difficulty is still able, who brought me through good times, is the same God who will bring me through difficulty. we got to maintain our faith and walk humbly, meaning we ain't trying to tell God how to run and rule our lives. We're walking humbly with God because he's God and we're not. He knows what to do. He knows where he's taking us. And he says, I need you to trust me. I'm going to get you to glory, but i got to have you trust me. Every eye is bowed, every, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If it's your desire... It's your desire to ask God to give you a spirit of humility, give you a spirit of yielding, give you a spirit where you cannot and will not be offended wherever God leads you. If that's your desire to, to have a humble spirit, a repentant spirit, a, a walk humbly with God, if that's your desire, I want you to raise your hand. I'm raising my hand, not an example, because I want that for my life too. That no matter where God leads me, there will I fall. I love the song that says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this life affords today. I love how the disciples said it. Uh, the disciples, when Jesus was going on his way uh, to Calvary, was about to be executed, uh, the disciples said, Master, if you go there, they're going to kill you. But then the Bible says, they said, you know what? They might kill Jesus, but because I love Jesus so much, I'm going to walk with him too. Because if they're going to kill him, they're going to have to kill me too. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Lord God, we need you. Father, we need spiritual stamina in these last days. Father, I'm reminded of the massacres in, 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 in Buffalo and in Uvalde, Texas. Lord God, the, Bible, the, 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 the news tells us that people were murdered just because they were black. Children were murdered just because they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Bible says, Lord, Jesus, you said it. There are going to be some things that happen in life that we will not be able to explain. That if we're not careful, it will permanently 
draw us away from you. Jesus, you gave us the life of John to teach us, to encourage us, even when the healing doesn't come, even when the miracle never happened in our experience, even when we have to die in our prison, Lord, help us to always stay faithful to you. We'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Lord, help us to have you as the goal of our life, the goal of everything that is beautiful and precious. And then give us strength, Lord God, to trust you, that you know what you're doing, you know what is best, and ultimately, we will reign, we will live, and we will be saved when you come again. So give us strength, a spiritual strength, spiritual stamina, spiritual fortitude as we traverse this thing called life. Now, for, for those who are out there who the Spirit of God has let you know, uh, uh, you need to give your whole life to Jesus. You need to embrace the spirit of repentance that Jesus preached, that John preached. You need to uh, 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 give your life to Christ completely and officially. If it's your desire to give your life to Christ and say, I want to prepare for baptism, I need you to raise your hand. I need you to raise your hand. You're saying, Jesus, I want to go all the way with you. I want to be baptized. I need you to raise your hand. God sees you. If you're online, I need you to reach out to me, Elder David 1844 at gmail.com. Elder David 1844 at gmail.com. And then there's a second appeal. The second appeal is if you're already a member of a church, but, but you know that God is calling you to be a part of this body, and, and, and you need to be uh, as, uh, involved uh, 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 in utilizing your spiritual gifts for the cause of Christ, and God is telling you, you need to be a part, become a part of Beacon Light, uh, uh, I want you to raise your hand. The, door, the doors of the church are open for you too. Amen. Amen. God sees you. God sees you. Anybody say they want to become a part of Beacon Light? Amen. Lord God, we are your children. We thank you, Lord God, for leading and guiding us thus far. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of John, which is not a pleasant testimony, nor is it one that we desire for ourselves, but it exists nonetheless. And some of us are actually living the John experience. Father, give that brother, give that sister strength to hold on when things get dark, things are unpleasant, when it seems like you're a million miles away, help them to remember that if you brought them to it, Lord God, you're going to maintain and you will keep them as they go through it. So Father God, be with your people. We thank you for the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. come at you for your beliefs. But I never thought about it. Blessed if you're not offended by what he makes you go through and what you experience. So that's new. That was a good word. I appreciate that. Uh, been a time for the benediction. Time for the benediction. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that the, the seed that was sown, that you would seal it. Uh, that wouldn't fall by the wayside or thorny ground and be choked up by the cares of this world. Uh, may the Lord bless you all, keep you all, be gracious unto you. And uh, we just pray that your spirit continue to move with us, walk with us, talk with us as we depart from here. And may uh, all the rest of our Sabbath be a blessing. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.